So that's a little bit about how the music transcended from that cotton, from the, from the slaves on the boat to the cotton fields and on into the church. Over time, African Americans found their voice and began to compose lyrics of their own. During the latter part of the 19th century and the early 20th century, they would sing about anything and everything. Banjo and fiddle were the main instruments, but they were hard to come by. Musicians used spoons and washboards, and they would even beat on tables. As it turned, at the turn of this 20th century, the mood of gospel could be heard in songs the community played during parties. They wanted to have songs for the parties so that it, that is when they started the revelry, the barn and corn songs, such as, I was with my baby last night, I held her tight, reminiscent of Paul Lawrence Dunbar's When Melindy Sings. When the era arrived in which banjos and guitars were more readily available, the late 1910s, uh, musicians created songs for every occasion. Prior to that, guitars, which originated in Spain and gravitated to America in the 16th century, were so expensive that slaves, or la later in history, former slaves, couldn't afford to buy them. So that's some of the things that Ben Payton talks about. This is a short book. I'm not, I'm not going to read the whole book to y'all, but I, but I want to highlight some of its, some of the, you know, where the music comes from and that sort of thing. Um, Dr. London Branch, who is an educator, a music educator, and who also won the Governor's Award for, uh, for I guess, at being a music educator, being an artistically uh, excellent music educator. In the foreword that he writes, he said, this is the story of Raleigh B.B. King and his journey from the cotton fields of Mississippi to the most elegant venues throughout the world. Raleigh King studied the music of the old musicians, some of whom passed on but made recordings that King could listen to, and others who were still alive who he listened to and studied. King's time in Memphis was very important and is referred to at length. Further, this book contains interviews conducted with both old and young mus musicians who either played with B.B. King or were influenced by his music. The book describes the musical and social conditions under which black musicians worked and lived. This book is a history of how an important genre of African American music developed from those humble beginnings into a very influential body of literature from which characterizations are present in virtually all American musical genres today. That's just a part of uh, what Dr. London Branch had to say about the book. And I value his opinion. I guess so, because he's in the book, right? <laughs> um, you know, I hadn't thought so much about this song that we've heard B.B. Uh, B. King sing. You know, why sing the blues? But I don't know what drew me to go and look up some of the words. And he's saying these words that you see on the screen as if he's talking about himself, but he's talking about those Africans that I mentioned. It says, when I first got the blues, they brought me over on a ship. Men were standing over me and a lot more with a whip and everybody want to know why I sing the blues. Well, I've been around a long, long time. Mm, I've really paid my dues and certainly he has done that. I'll do a, another short reading for you. It is also important to note that King's success helped blues music. He helped the genre of blues music. Uh, indeed, he worked for the recognition of the music more than personal recognition, traveling almost every day of the year to showcase his God-given talent. 
was a testament to his desire to perpetuate and preserve the art form. He was a trendsetter, moving the blues along, creatively stretching boundaries with new and distinct licks. Through all of this, King always remembered where the music came from. The songs of native Africans voiced their souls, rhythms over the waters of the Middle Passage to places like the Americas. Those songs made their way onto the cotton fields and were sung in the hot sun and became a testament to the fortitude of brave men and women who were forced into slave labor and held captive against their will. Those songs are also a testament to the downtrodden and hopeless, those men and women less fortunate than anyone would ever desire to be did not sing deaf dirges in an effort to hold on. They sang songs of hope that became codes and songs of jubilee. Those songs of hope progressed and became reflections on daily life, its whims and its woes. In turn, they became the songs of people. And I, you know, I have to write from this perspective. Somebody told me, you know, as a storyteller, all of my stories are based on, based on faith, Hope, love, and victory. So I, I just have to write that way. It's, and that's why I get excited as I'm reading. Uh, in turn, they became the songs of people rising up out of sad and depressing situations from the first years of African captivity in America beginning around 1619 to emancipation and onward. But look, listen what Frederick Douglass had to say. I just love researching and trying to find out different information. Uh, Frederick Douglass said, I have often been utterly astonished since I came to the North to find persons who could speak of the singing among slaves as evidence of their contentment and happiness. It is impossible to conceive of a greater mistake. Slaves sing most when they are most unhappy. The songs of the slaves represent the sorrows of his heart, and he is relieved by them, only as an aching heart is relieved by his tears. At least such is my experience, Frederick Douglass said. Uh, I have often sung to drown my sorrows, but seldom to express my happiness. Crying for joy and singing for joy were alike uncommon to me while in the jaws of slavery. The singing of a man cast away upon a desolate island might be an appropriately or might be as appropriately considered as evidence of contentment and happiness as the singing of a slave. The songs of the one and of the other are prompted by the same emotion. As the turn at the turn of the 20th century, blues songs were more than just vocalizations of old men reflecting on hard times, love, and loss. Blues songs were sung throughout the Jim Crow era, another period when African Americans struggled with institutionalized oppression and racial segregation. People ask me, have you ever met B.B. King? Yes, I have met B.B. King. And B.B. King had a solid message, you all. His, I don't think his message ever changed. He didn't have a whole lot of eloquent things to talk about other than to talk about how he came up and those sort of things. But he had a message because he wanted young people. His message was mostly to young people. And when I first met him, it, it was at a gathering in Canton, Mississippi at the library. Everybody didn't know he was going to be there, but I found out B.B. King was going to be in the room. And I, was, I used to perform with a guy named Oscar Wilson. He played harmonicas. And Oscar wanted to meet B.B. King so bad, so I said, "You come on, you can go with me. Big old burly kind of a guy. You can see him on YouTube and Facebook and that sort of thing. He sings the blues, but he wanted to meet him. <clears throat> and I'll just tell y'all when B.B. King, the, you know, a man, you know, he always had somebody handle Lucille. There's usually more than one Lucille. And that person would bring Lucille into the room, place it, you know, 
in the front of the audience, and then you'd, you'd sit there and wait. All the children were sitting down. They were on the floor. And their mamas and them was all around in the chairs around the room. B.B. King walked in the room. Oh, y'all know. He just, we just love B.B. King. We just you know, treat him like he's just the finest man going. We didn't care that he had diabetes, had gained weight. To us, he was fine. He walked in that room, he looked around, he looked at the, all the grown folks sitting around the wall. He looked down at the floor, at the children, and he said, y'all don't know who I am, do you? <laughs> they didn't know. But their mamas and them knew, and that's why those kids were there, because their mamas wanted them to meet B.B. King, and that meant all the world to him to be able to talk to those children. And he talked like I talked to my grandchild, in simple terms that would encourage you to go on and be, the, whether you want to be a musician or not, to be the very best you can. The people that I interviewed that are musicians, there were a couple of them that they were performing at a time when B.B. King got to hear them perform. And for whatever reason it was, you've got to read the book, they made mistakes. They made mistakes. But afterwards, B.B. King would talk to them, and he would say, uh, you know, it's all right. Keep doing what you're doing. You know, keep doing your best. So that's, that's the kind of person he was. And just like Pam talking to me and encouraging me, it encourages you to keep on moving forward. And, and you, can listen, you can hear from some of these people today to find out they're, they're great musicians in their community, in their regions, in the, in, 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 um, and maybe in the nation sometime. So B.B. King's message is he was one to be an ambassador for the blues. Dr. London Branch, in his foreword, talked about what Europeans thought, and let's go way, way back now, because, you know, you got the fine arts, you got, you know, classical music, and we acknowledge those things, and we have awards, national awards for music. We don't, I don't know that we have a national just blues award. We, I see that, you know, we got blue societies. I see some of those folks in the audience, and I think that's so great because we're doing what we can to preserve the music. You got National Country Music Awards, but if you look at the past, what uh, Dr. Branch was saying is that the, the, the blues wasn't acknowledged in that sort of way. It was black folks' music. Now, black folks, we have to acknowledge the music ourselves. We have to celebrate that music. So uh, that's 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 sort of like the past, and that's what B.B. King wanted to change. And as you know, as time went on, if you move up to the present, you know, coming forward in his lifetime and into most of the present, you the Europeans, they got on planes, and you know, you had um, these rock stars, U2, and, and, and different uh, musicians and things that wanted to play with him. Eric Clapton and many others wanted to learn more about the blues music. And when they started wanting to know more about it, America wanted to know more about blues music. That's the present. Now, when I went to B.B. King's funeral, and people said, well, what's going to happen? You know, B.B. King's gone now. You know, uh, does the blue, is the blues going to die with B.B. King? What do y'all think? No. no. Blues, because, you, know, you know, I'm talking about B.B. King, but you read the book, there's a whole lot more than just B.B. King in that book because that's what he would want you to know. No, the blues is not going to die. King's hope for the music was the future. The future is really not speculative. It's not speculative query. In reference to, and, and, and let me just uh, go to the side here. In, in the movie, Just Mercy, <laughs> and the life's work of Brian... Stevenson, y'all know what I'm talking about, the new movie that's out. Um, he, uh, Brian Stevenson is the uh, founder of the Equal Justice Initiative, and it's just such documentation if you go to Montgomery, Alabama, and see this fine work that he did, the lynching monument and, and different things like that, and, and then trying to find justice for people that have been incarcerated that have not 
committed the crime, but because of our system of injustice in America, Alabama, Mississippi, and places like that, there are these struggles and it's hard to decipher uh, through the judicial system. But what Brian said was slavery d doesn't end. I never heard that before. Slavery doesn't end, it just evolves. Some of you are nodding, both blacks and whites, so I think you understand what I'm talking about. So we still have a whole lot of reasons to sing the blues. <laughs> blues not gonna die, because there's a lot of things going on. The best part, you know, I had a speaking engagement back in, I think it was July or August, at the Grammy Museum, and I was supposed to talk about the book that was supposed to be out. <laughs> and the book didn't come out till November. So I thought, oh my God, what am I going to talk about? Because I don't want to give it away. I want people to buy the book, or at least to inquire about the book. So I said, backstory. Let's talk backstory. That's the best story, y'all, the story behind the story. Storytellers and news media love the story behind the story. So I'm going to answer your first question. We're going to open up for questions and answers later. But the first question is, Diane, how did you come about writing a book about B.B. King? I know, I know. B.B. King wasn't even on my mind, y'all. <laughs> but I was talking to Leela Salisbury. Some of you may know her. She used to be at the University Press of Mississippi. And, you know, she would always talk to me and say, well, you know, maybe one day you'll write something for us or something like that. And we kept talking. And she said, what do you think about writing a book about B.B. King? I had never even thought about it. You know, I had just finished writing The Mississippi Folk and the Tales They Tell. I hadn't thought about writing about B.B. King. But I thought, oh, how interesting that would be. And so that, that's how the idea got started five long years ago. By the way, if you're a writer, be careful. It's, it's a lot of work, number one, and then it's a lot of getting on the road and promoting it and learning how to talk about it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You got to have a deep love in your heart and in your gut to do what you do. So uh, that's how I got started, and, and the University Press is not the publisher of the book, but you know I, I can't say enough about the University Press because they were so, so supportive. Craig Gill is there now, and what a kind man, what a, you know, just very helpful. I don't think the book would be where it is today in its writing if it was not for the University Press, so I give them acknowledgments in the book. And then, after I started writing the book, you know, I'm minding my business. You know how it is. I decide to go to the movie. I'm looking at a pitch in the movie, and I get a text message. It's Jim Dollahide. Y'all know Jim Dollahide, the filmmaker? Like, I don't know him. How did he get my number? He said, I heard you writing this book about B.B. King. You can't write no book without talking to me. I know, I, I know, you know, I filmed him. I know so much, la, 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 in the B.B. King Museum, and he had all of those connections. So I left out the theater, and I called him on the phone, and, oh, I could use some pictures and things like that for my book. So we got to talk, and he told me to come to his house, and he would give me some pictures. And so I went to his house, and I walked around the property. It was so quiet. I looked around. Jim, Jim. Jim wasn't at home. The door was wide open, but Jim wasn't at home. So I didn't get any pictures that day. Then I called him on the phone. And maybe I shouldn't tell these kinds of stories, but it's my story. <laughs> so Jim told me when I called him on the phone, he said, leave me alone. So I left him alone, but he called me again. And he said, I'll give you everything you need on a jump drive. 
<coughs> then I saw him at B.B. King's funeral, but I decided not to say anything. I didn't, you know, I didn't want him to say no directly to my face, so I didn't say anything. But not long after that, some of you, if you know Jim, Jim Dollahide, he uh, died in a house fire. It was very sad. So whether he was going to give me those pictures or not, I have no idea, but um, he has passed on. So that's one backstory. <clears throat> had an opportunity to go to B.B. King's funeral. Now, I'm a person not of ideas. I'm a person of implementation. It's sim you know, my life is simple. It's not a big deal. I'm not, I don't work for IBM or anything like that, but my life is very simple. And, and, and so I, I go to the funeral, and I had been doing a lot of my writing in Florida. I would go down for, for the weekend, and I would do some, you know, we all need those retreats when we're writers. And so I had been in communication with a radio station down there. I'm at the funeral, and somebody, uh, the radio station manager called me. He said, you, you heard B.B. King died. Where are you at? I said, I'm at the funeral. He said, we're going live on the air right now. Go ahead. Be the anchor. Talk about what's happening. I got the TV station. And there I was, <laughs> talking to him about B.B. King's funeral. But the fun part, <laughs> um, when I, I went over to the B.B. King Museums before the funeral, and they allowed me, and you'll see the picture in the book, I'm holding two loose seals that were placed at the, at the church during the funeral that were in front of the, I was like the security guard. I got, I got the guitars. I'm getting in the van. We taking them over to the funeral parlor so they could put them in the church. Nobody knows this but me and you, y'all. Because <laughs> I probably would have gotten a whole lot of trouble, but somebody was being very kind to let me touch Lucille's. Uh, <laughs> so I did have an opportunity to um, go to his funeral, and I met a photographer out of Vicksburg, and he went with me, so he took all the pictures for me that I needed, and he was a songwriter, so we were just singing up and down the road. Um, <clears throat> getting pictures for the book was a challenge. It was a real big challenge because people would tell me yes, and then they would tell me no, and then they would tell me yes again, and so this project went on for five years. But that's okay. Now, the fun, another fun thing that happened was in 2014, before B.B. King died, I went with a friend to San Francisco to uh, a concert, a B.B. King concert in San Francisco. That was really, really exciting. And we got to see him in concert, but you know, that was just a few short months before he passed away. And, and so, um, his performance wasn't the same. I wrote about it as best I could. I didn't want to say anything bad about how he performed. But I just talked about we, the audience, we were just living off of his, you know, his history, his, his you know, his memory, his, you know, all this wonderful thing about his life. And that's what we went there and we did. We waited an hour before he got up on the stage and, and he just wasn't the same. The riffs, you know, the way he trilled on the guitar wasn't the same, but I enjoyed myself. And then when I crossed the water, I think I always forget the name, Emityville, right across the bridge. And I stayed at this hotel. And I'm sitting in the lobby, and I'm, I'm sitting at the bar, and I'm talking to my friend, because it's late, you know, so we're just sitting there. Everybody's going up to their rooms and everything. And there's a man sitting down at the end of the bar. And he said, you went to the B.B. King concert? I said, yeah. He said, did you see me? No, I didn't see you. Where were you? He said, I'm B.B. King's musician, and he turned around. I, don't, I didn't have permission from him, but I do have that picture. I took a picture of his jacket, <laughs> but I didn't know how to get in touch with him to get permission to put it in the book. And uh, the band members were there, and I said, I'm writing a book about B.B. King. Could y'all let me go up to his room and talk to him? This story is happy and this story is sad. So, um, you know that, the, I think his name is Myron, the guy that m kind of manages all the details. He was over at the counter checking in and all of those things. And, and the musician that I was talking to and the bus driver, 
I, I can't even explain it to y'all. I'm talking to them, and they just, uh, they're just talking to me. They never told me B.B. King was right behind me going up to his room <laughs> until he got up to his room, and they said, you just missed him. <laughs> so um, I asked if I could meet him before they left the next. I'm in the same hotel with B.B. King. I'm trying to write a book, and I cannot get an interview. But I'm stubborn. I'm from Newark, New Jersey. I'm going to meet B.B. King. So Myron, or whatever his name is, because I'm older and I can't remember names, uh, he said, come down to the lobby um, about 8 o'clock in the morning, and you'll meet B.B. King. I knew he was lying. <laughs> I went down to the lobby 6 o'clock in the morning, and I sat there. And I waited for B.B. King. And so the, the musicians came down. They're talking to me. And, they, you know, musicians sometimes, they, they're, every musician I have met, every blues musician, I don't know about the other kind, but every blues musician I have met has been very kind to me and talked to me. And, and you know, and so they're down there talking to me. I don't know if I could say it. I was trying to meet B.B. King, y'all. <laughs> I'm so naive. The men are talking to me. I never saw the bus when it pulled off. <laughs> I, how could I miss the big provost bus? Two of them. They pulled on around the back, had B.B. King on the bus. I never saw him. So, no, I don't know him like that. But one thing that happened while I was in that hotel, in the middle of the night, I guess about 12 o'clock, I don't know what time it was, but you could read about it in the paper somewhere or something, there was an earthquake. I'm in the same hotel with B.B. King, and I'm asleep. My friend girl is sleeping in the other bed, and the bed starts going like this. And I'm like, what is she doing over there? <laughs> and and, and is, did she come over to my bed? It's going like this, and then I open my eyes, I see her by the window, and I see, you know, things, the bathroom door was just going, opening and closing, my God, and that was just a 4.0. That was just a 4.0, so B.B. King, had he had that same experience I had that night. <laughs> but no, I didn't get to interview him, but as you know, he died of vascular dementia, so at that time, that was August of 2014, and he died in May of 2015. So he was really not in the shape that I could talk to him, that I could interview him. And most of the information I got, I did a lot of research. And oh my God, the research, y'all, I don't know what it used to be like for scholars. But today, you got, you'll read books, and, and there'll be misinformation sometime. And just to give you a good example, if you go to the internet and you look up the life and legacy of B.B. King, a Mississippi blues icon, there's a white lady's picture in her background, and that is not me. I'm in the book <laughs> to prove who I am. So I'm trying to like, you know, so misinformation will be out there, and you'll think it's just right because you have a picture. You know, even like B.B. King's with his first wife and their marriage, I was grateful to get a copy of their um, marriage license because I found so many different dates and things. So what am I telling you? I did the very best that I could to include accurate information. I literally, I had to get out of the state, just go somewhere, and I'm down in Florida with index cards with, and where I got the information, filling up a whole table trying to figure out dates on, you know, when different landmarks happened in his life. It, it, it was really something. I'm going to go really quick. Don't read all that. <laughs> but I highlighted certain things because I want to bring out a point. 
I highlight that human life is fundamental reality and as a happening. You can try to make, uh, uh, you know, talking about blues music and you could do it in, in as much of a scholarly perspective as you want to. But it is emotion. It is a feeling. It's a life experience. If you haven't had that life experience yet, you could try to sing about it. And it's like America's got talent. You may be good and you may not be good. But it's, 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 it's authentic. It's being and it's authentic. Just look at the highlighted words. I'm not going to make you. This is some philosopher, Jose Ortega y Uh it's, it's, It has its historical attitude. Uh, and, and Ortega, uh, uh, Gassat, he challenged positivist approaches to history. The blues is black folks' history. And, and, and it reflects on black flo folks' lives, you all. Ortega, Ortega said, Life is a series of collisions with the future. It is not the sum of what we have been, but what we yearn to be. And I say the blues is not only a man's dire situation, but also the hope of coming up out of a dire situation. And, and that's what B.B. King would want you to know. Uh, Ortega, also, uh, uh, Ortega also said, I am, I am plus my surroundings. And if I do not preserve the latter, I do not preserve myself. It's an important to preserve blues and blues music. B.B. Uh, King came from a humble beginning, Mississippi Delta. Uh, there's a lot more I could say about that, but he was born in 1925, died in uh, 20, May 2015. Uh, near Indianola, up there, Itabina in that area, Berkeley, LaFleur County. Um, and he was, if he was born in 1925, think about what it must have been like for his family because two years after he was born, the Great Flood of 1927 happened up there in the Mississippi Delta. Times were really, really hard. And then not only that, if your brain, I know, is just con continuing to click on, you know that the Great Depression happened in America. So he grew up in a tough time. He had a younger brother who was, I think, two years younger than him who died from eating glass. B.B. King never got over things like that, you know. He never got over, you know, those humble beginnings from whence he came. He, he grew up, um, you know, his parents separated. His mother died of diabetes. His grandmother died not a year after that. He was left alone and continued to work on the plantation owner's uh, uh, plantation and paid most of his grandmother's debt, but he lived alone and, and that had an impact on him because he was very, very young. He was not a teenager. He was a young boy and, and to live alone, no electricity in the house and things like that. He had a flashlight and do you know till the day he died, he never slept in a dark room. He always slept with a flashlight. You never know what famous people are going through. You never know what people are going through. You never know how people might need some encouragement. He, he went through um, um, a lot of things, Trou but trouble don't last always. You know, he had tax debt. He was so afraid on standing on the stage early in his career, he always thought the IRS was sitting out there in the audience. When he finally got a, a bus, um, the bus, he wasn't on the bus at the time, but it had an accident with a truck, and the truck driver, the, 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 the uh, truck caught flames, and the man died. And his insurance had just expired like a couple of days before. So, but, but trouble don't last always. Things got better for him. You know how he came about naming his guitar Lucille. He was out there in the juke joints and things like that. And so when the, uh, when the juke joint caught on fire, he ran back in there, he wasn't thinking, to get his guitar. But then afterwards, he realized, you know, the importance. He wasn't well educated. But this, you may not know this as well, that he started out singing gospel music. He started out with a gospel choir. They thought they were famous up there in the Mississippi Delta. But then he would go over there to Indianola and he would stand on the corner of Church Street and he'd see some of the musicians and he would even try to play his guitar hat on the ground. People put coins in there and he found that he could make more money singing the blues. Mahalia Jackson said, any Negro can sing the blues. 
but she believed in you know, ser serving God, but then telling others about God. And that's the piece that was missing with B.B. King. The, the music took over. He could get an amen when he sang gospel, but he could get some money when he sang the blues. <laughs> So you know about this, I would get the book just to find out what happened on Beale Street. Oh my God, remember the man that, that sang Walking the Dog? Oh man, he was head of the talent uh, in the community and things like that back in the day. Back in the day, Beale Street was bigger than New Orleans down there on Bourbon Street at one time. And um, I name a lot of the recording companies, but there was a woman... Um, that helped B.B. King, she was a black woman, and it's so unheard of that a black woman in those times, her name was Evelyn Johnson. Now we should be talking about her during Black History Month because this black woman is the one, one of the ones that really helped to boost B.B. King's career. In the book, you'll find out more about the juke joints and chitlin circuits, and I love what Bobby Rush had to say about the chitlin circuits. You know, they used to give chitlins away for free from the factories, you know, and they would give them to the guys that played in the juke joints, so therefore we had chitlin circuits. Um, but the other thing is, B.B. Uh, King was an activist. He went into the prisons, and he encouraged people in the prisons, and you should know about that. And then, I t then the book changes, a little short book, but then it goes from talking about B.B. King's life to talking to a couple of his family members. I'm really good friends with Shirley King. I didn't talk to all the family. There's a lot going on in that family right now. I'm like about peace, y'all. So I, I'm, I haven't gotten into that. I don't know who's been poisoned. I don't know anything like that. <laughs> uh, so, um, but he impressed all of them, I do want to say that. And I want to, uh, just the, one of the last things I want to say, you know, B.B. King performed over 300 days a year. After months of constantly rolling a stone, it does not gather moss. All those 15 children, I have no idea, but he was on the road 300 and some odd days a year. Um, Prakash Slim said that B.B. King globalized the blues. This is a guy that lives in a place called Nepal. He's, on my, he's a Facebook friend. And he sold his little bicycle. You know, living in a little village, he sold his bicycle and he purchased a guitar. And now he's just playing Indian, you know, Indian style, but it's, he's trying to play the blues and he's teaching blues in the schools. And people are acknowledging that, whether he's, you know, you know he's not nationally known or anything like that, but that's the impact that the blues can have. And then uh, Diane Williams said, <laughs> y'all need to have some of your own original quotes. I believe in them. If Robert Johnson sold his soul to the devil at the crosswords, it certainly can be said that B.B. King, King gave his heart and his soul to the musical highway. Uh, the Mississippi Arts Commission on their website has a blues trail curriculum that you can go to their website. You don't even have to have web addresses today. You could just Google stuff. And then also on the B.B. King Museum and Delta Interpretive Center, they have... Um, a blues curriculum written by Althea Jerome. And you can take a picture of that with your phone if you want to just have, did I put the, the links are very light, but you could do, I'll leave it up there. So at this time, I had to go real quick towards the end. Uh, are, there, are there any questions for me? <laughs> and we have somebody that will come around with a microphone because there's a lot of people here. And y'all be careful what y'all ask me. <laughs> I'm a storyteller. I'm not a scholar. <laughs> I like research, so that's how we get the information in the book. But yes. Diane, during your extensive research, what was the most surprising thing that you found out about B.B. King? I think the most surprising thing was how he lived as a child and how he overcame that. It reminds me of myself, you know, a tough background, but he didn't let it stop him. Nobody told him he couldn't do what he did. He never thought he was really good at it. He was always striving to be better. And, and, and that surprised me because I could, and I think a lot of young people could relate to that. Any other questions? Thank you. I, I, um, 
I wanted to make sure to come um, to this presentation because um, my, my mother is one of, one of those people who live in that area where B.B. Where, um, King grew up. And she told us um, about some of his life. Um, he was a playmate of her, her older brother. Wow. So um, there, there, there are some things I, I could share, but um, it, it, it would be too, too much to take the time now. Um, she didn't tell, tell us this until later in her life, and I, I don't understand why, but um, she, she, he came to perform in Jackson, and she wanted to just go and say hello. And um, when, uh, when, when she, she told me about it, then I became interested. I, I was in Pennsylvania at the time, and he came to perform at Williamsport. So I, I wrote a note to ask him to please call her to say hello and gave a card uh, with, with the information on it. But unfortunately, I, he, he, he didn't. And um, she passed away before they could make contact. Thank you for sharing that. Any other questions? Hi, I'm Hi. from the Mississippi Delta. I think I can answer her question about why her mother didn't tell her earlier. We were ashamed of the blues. Wow, did y'all hear that? <laughs> uh, we were ashamed of the blues. It's called familiarity breeds contempt, and we were ashamed of the blues. We worshiped Mahalia Jackson, but we were ashamed of the blues. You know, that brings up a good point because they called it the devil's music, remember? Uh, sell your soul to the devil to play the blues, mm -hmm. which means that you were definitely hellbound. There's a blues called hellbound. But my question is, I married into a family from Mali, and they have desert blues. And the question is, did we get the blues from them or did they get it from us? I'm not a scholar, so I'm not able to answer your question. I'm just messing with you. I didn't, because <laughs> I'm an anthropologist by training, and okay. I have not been able to answer it, but mm -hmm. north of the Hill Mississippi Blues sounds pretty much exactly like the Desert Blues from Mali. Isn't that amazing? But still, we don't know if they copied us or we copied them. Well, they tell me there's no new ideas, and you know somebody's done some of these things that we're doing today a long time ago. Other questions? Hey, Miss Diane, how are you doing? <laughs> um, I had a question for you, but I kind of wanted to address a little bit of what you just said. I actually work at the International Museum of Muslim Cultures, which is right here downtown. And at our uh, Timbuktu exhibit, we actually make the connection between the Adhan and the call to prayer in Islam and how that is actually very closely related to the blues and the call and response song that you actually just got done singing, we make mm -hmm. that connection in the exhibit. And um, my father was Chick Willis, he was a blues singer, and that completely resonated with me that that connection was made because it was a call to God, a way to sort of call out the pain that we were going through. So that transformation is very natural. But um, with my father being a blues singer and sort of being in the middle of the blues and the development of hip hop in my generation, there was the disconnect, I think, that came from the shame that a lot of black people felt for the blues and it being the devil's music. And then there was an extreme disconnect between hip hop artists and the blues. Now, not saying hip hop artists didn't steal and use, they did, but I don't think that that sort of mentor mentorship and connection was made from the blues men's side. I know my father used to very much describe hip hop as blah, 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 blah. That's how he always said it. 
And so that connection wasn't made. So I would like to know as an artist, what would be your suggestion for continuing the tradition of the blues and making it really relevant to younger generations? Good question, and I think you should read the book because Dexter Allen, <laughs> and for a reason, for a reason, Dexter Allen, I talked to Dexter Allen and he addresses some of those things and also talked to J. Juan Smith. Y'all know J. Juan, I got this record that I want to play. Uh, so, you know, young people are still, you know, J. Juan, you know, actually doesn't even have to sing his songs. Little kids and old folks and all in between. He stands with a microphone. You can see it on YouTube. He stands with a microphone. He, he echoes out two or three words and the audience takes over. So you see what's happening? It's intergenerational, but we got Southern Soul. We got, you know, Malcolm Shepard's here. He could address all that kind of stuff. But we have, it, it's more, Bobby Rush said it's morphing. You know, and I think you said the same thing, Malcolm, that it's morphing, it's evolutionary, you know, it's continuing to go on. Dexter Allen said, you know, I don't have to walk down the street with a straw hat on, a toothpick in my mouth and a guitar on my back, you know. I don't have to sing out in the cotton fields. I can buy cotton, you know, and that sort of thing. So um, it, it, it does continue and, and young people are taking it and doing the things that they want to do. And I just want to add one one last thing. Uh, I think it's something, you know, it went from being devil's music to now we're listening to the music, but so did playing ball in the yard, y'all. They, they, they said, don't, Ben Payton talks about how when he was playing ball in the yard, it's it, anything that wasn't praising God and lifting up the name of God in worship was of the devil at one time. So that, there, that's where that comes from. But I think some of these musicians have gone through the era. Bobby Rush talks about, uh, you know, he had to stand in one spot to play behind Elvis Presley in a circle. And if he stepped a foot outside of that circle, they would dock his pay. These are things we don't see visibly when we're watching them. And then, and then there was a time when blacks had to uh, perform behind a curtain. We want, they wanted to hear us, but they didn't want to see us. So I think we should all, I get tickled by the blues myself, uh, but I think we should all just understand that history and what a whole lot of people went through during Jim Crow, Re Reconstruction, Jim Crow, civil rights, and all of that so that music is, could be still here today and still do some of the things that it's doing. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. If you want to keep up with the programs in the series, you can sign up in the corner over there for our email list. You can pick up schedule, other literature. Thank you for being here. I hope that we see you uh, here next week. We have copies not just of The Life and Legacy of B.B. King, but also Diane's previous book, Mississippi Folk and the Tales They Tell. Please come over, say a word, and thank you for being here today. Help me thank Diane for this fabulous program.